Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Bolzan, Executive Director of GMGI, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 season of the GMGI Science Hour. We are thrilled to be back in your living rooms with a new episode of Innovations in Marine Science. We set another record number of registrations tonight. We're so glad you're all here. This evening, we welcome Dr. Peter Jurgis of Harvard University with his talk entitled, This is Not Planet Earth, Adaptations to Life in the Deep Sea. It is so exciting to have so many of you with us tonight online. We appreciate the great feedback, ideas, enthusiasm we have received for continuing this series and are so encouraged by the tremendous appetite for science education our community has shown. When GMGI was founded in 2013, local scientists, community members, and entrepreneurs envisioned that the ocean could be a renewed source of opportunity for Cape Ann. Our ambitious mission is to address critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education by bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. With your support, we have delivered on these promises and are now poised to do a great deal more. Stay tuned, follow our newsletters, tune in to our social media channels and our press because we have some very exciting developments underway. We are also hiring for a number of new positions across all areas of GMGI. So if you've ever been interested in joining our team, check out the career page on our website and reach out if you think that this is the time to join our exciting venture. With that, I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combs Science Director, who will introduce Peter. If you have any questions you'd like to submit this evening, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we're going to do our best to get to all of the questions that come through and that time allows. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. And over to you, Andrea. Thanks, Chris, and good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Combs Science Director at GMGI, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's Science Hour speaker, Dr. Peter Gerges. Uh, Peter is a professor of organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard University, where he studies the adaptations of marine animals and microbes to their environments. He has a particular interest in the partnerships between animals and microbes and how they work together to promote survival, especially under extreme conditions like a deep sea hydrothermal vents. He's, in these studies, uh, he uses a combination of many different technologies ranging from molecular biology and genomics to physiological and chemical analyses to examine the relationship between microbial diversity, physiology, and biogeochemical cycles. Because of the challenges of making measurements under extreme conditions like extreme temperatures and pressures, he and his lab have developed novel instruments and samplers that enable them to better study the conditions and the organisms living under these conditions. His goal is to make these technologies broadly available to the research community to promote better understanding of our biosphere and to help inform the policymakers who govern the fate of our oceans. Peter received his PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara and was a Packard postdoctoral fellow at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute before joining Harvard um, in 2005. He serves on the board of the Ocean Exploration Trust and the Smith, Smith Ocean Institute, and his honors include the 2007 and the 2011 Lindbergh Foundation Award for Science and Sustainability, the 2018 Lowell Thomas Award for Groundbreaking Advances in Marine Science and Technology, and the 2020 Petra Shatuck uh, Award for Distinguished Teaching. He was recently named a Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation Investigator for his research on marine symbiosis. So tonight, Peter is going to take us on a journey to some of the most extreme parts of our planet, which, according to the title of his talk, is not the planet Earth. So I'm going to turn things over to Peter. Hello, thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, and um, I, I really appreciate the invitation to be here tonight, and thank you to all of you who are tuning in uh, on this Thursday night before another Massachusetts snowmageddon. 
Um, now, I, I really appreciate the, the kind words you said and, and highlighting some of the many opportunities I had throughout my professional career. Uh, working at UC Santa Barbara with a deep sea physiologist, working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is an institution dedicated to bringing engineers and scientists together, uh, and now having this privilege of being here at Harvard University. And throughout that journey, uh, and, um, and also owing to my growing up in Los Angeles in an aerospace town, uh, I've come to realize that as we study the world around us, there are a few things. Uh, sort of themes that keep coming back. And I wanna share these with you before I start sharing with you a bit of the science that we do. One is that no matter where I go on earth, even to the deepest oceans, to the parts of the oceans that have the least amount of food or nutrition or to the really exotic and extreme underwater hot springs, there are always connections that, bring, that tie us, we humankind to those environments really clear inextricable connections, which I will try and touch upon in the next 30 minutes or so. The second thing is that science is driven by technology, but technology that's applied smartly. There's that old adage of, I have a hammer, I'm gonna go looking for nails. Well, that's not as useful as saying, here's a problem, can I build a tool to solve it? And I've been really lucky to work with engineers and people in my life who've taught me how to do that. And being in a position now of, of tremendous privilege, I see an opportunity to use the resources we have to take people from around the world, people who don't have the same privilege and opportunities to write a big grant or hire a research vessel, to try and engage people from all walks of life in our science and to share the tools with scientists and scholars and the general public around the world. And as my hope that we as a community continue to move in that direction, which I see us doing, so that we can bring more and more understanding, right? Or learn more and more about this ocean and our relationship with it. Now, tonight, I wanted to share with you all a little bit about our research uh, and start by setting uh, the stage by reminding us a bit about the ocean and then telling you a bit about the tools we've developed and then sharing two stories about how we use those tools to study parts of our ocean that are surprisingly close to us and parts of our ocean that are a bit more exotic. So without any further ado, I wanna start by reminding us that the deep sea is the largest habitat on earth and that all of the other ecosystems that we're probably more familiar with, from the Amazon, rainforests, deserts and tundras, Boston, all of the continents, all of those are about 20% of our planet's living space. 80% of our planet's living space by volume is deep sea. And deep sea, is, as we define it, is ocean beyond the reach of sunlight, seawater that's in permanent darkness. That's about a kilometer down. So I've made this joke countless times, so forgive me if some of you heard this before, but if aliens came to Earth and visited and they had to go back and report to their chancellor what life on Earth is like, they would tell her that the average condition on Earth is cold, wet, dark, and salty, right? Because that is our planet's predominant living space. Now, humankind's exploration of the deep sea goes way back because humans have always, frankly, humans have evolved on the coasts. Many great civilizations are tied to water in one way or another. And, you know, from uh, the old sort of the old gentleman diving suit in the 18th century uh, to pearl divers around the world, uh, sitting in underwater bell jars to uh, Bibi and Barton doing their dive uh, in the 1930s today to, uh, to Jim Cameron's uh, work and in diving into the Challenger Deep and, uh, and so on. Exploration goes back. Humans have long wanted to know what lies in the deep ocean. But we cannot simply hold our breath and go down there. Now, I'm sharing a photo here of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and I, uh, my family and I were lucky enough to go this past summer to the Grand Canyon and peer over it and into it. And we were astonished. But, you know, we can easily stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon and look down into the bottom 
of this canyon, or we can see 25 miles out on a good clear day. But we can't do that in the ocean. Water is electromagnetically opaque. You can't just look into it or shine a bright light. The, you know, the ocean is also pretty hostile to us. You know, the temperatures in the ocean are near freezing and the pressures are immense. As creatures that have air spaces in our bodies, we cannot simply subject ourselves to tens and hundreds of atmospheres of pressure uh, because that's a very bad day. And so we know so little about the ocean because unlike the Grand Canyon, we can't just go for a walk into the ocean's canyons. And as I mentioned, sunlight doesn't penetrate below a thousand meters and water's electromagnetically opaque, so we can't just see the bottom of the ocean. The deepest part in the ocean is about half the distance I drive to work every day. And we can't see it. And it's only been visited by fewer people than have been on the surface of the moon. So it is a difficult challenge, but never fear. It's vast. We barely know what's happening. We have better maps of Mars than we do of the seafloor. But the last century has been a real kind of watershed of technologies that help us explore and understand the deep sea. And so what I wanted to do is share with you a couple of examples of how technologies that have their origins in another purpose have been adapted for use in the deep ocean. And I wanna start with this picture you see on your screen here. Uh, this is about um, 1,200 meters deep off the Oregon coast. And what you're looking at is a, a sort of bird's eye view, if you can see my cursor here, of a robot submarine. You can see its tether or leash. This is how we control it. And it's shining bright lights on this thing. This device is called the Abyss Lander. And the Abyss Lander um, is a seafloor laboratory developed in our lab with support from NASA. Now, uh, planetary scientists have known and are finding more and more bodies of water on moons, on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, the so -called, their so-called ocean worlds. And though you may be surprised to hear that, it's also surprising to know that water is not scarce in the universe. Comets are frozen water. Whoops, let me go back. Didn't mean to jump ahead. Comets are frozen, right? Frozen comets are made of ice. Uh, there are these oceans on the moons of Europa and Enceladus. Quasars have more water, hundreds of thousands of times more water than on Earth. So water is abundant. And the question then becomes, if you have water, this critical element for life as we know it, do you have life? So NASA scientists have been pushing the envelope and studying these ocean worlds. But interestingly, NASA is very good at doing work in space. But frankly, many NASA technologists hate water. The instruments they design, water is their mortal enemy. And when we sit in a room uh, together and talk about our research, I'm always thinking, my goodness, you all have made extraordinary technologies. How in the world do you make something that small? And then after I present our work there, they think, oh my goodness, how in the world do you put stuff like that in the water? So this project is actually bringing us together to, to design tools that allow us to understand how you explore an ocean world. This is a device that is about the size of an elevator car. So it's about six feet by six feet by nine feet. And the orange boxes you see on it are batteries. And it's populated with instruments and sensors and we deploy this down on the seafloor like an autonomous laboratory. And one of the things that excites me the most about this development is we've taken many of the tools that we put on robot subs or on ships, and we put them on this thing and let it collect data. And we also are able to collect video and images uh, and thus use the video, not just to see the fishes and the like that are swimming there, but use the video to adjust the position of the sensing probes and all the other tools. But I just mentioned that water is electromagnetically opaque. Now, most of the time, the way we communicate through water is acoustically, which is um, a silly analogy. It's kind of like yelling through the water. Sound travels really well. So we can send a bunch of squeaks and squawks through the water and pass data, but it's at speeds of dial-up modems. Now, I can't see all of your faces the you know, 85 or, you, or so of you out there who are listening, but I imagine some of you have never worked with a dial-up modem and some of you have. Those of you who have know my pain. 
Dial-up modems are slow. You can't communicate video. You, you don't do things at broadband speeds. It's the opposite of broadband. And that is how we talk underwater until now. My colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution have been working on optical modems. This is a way of using lights to flash at one another and communicate at broadband speeds underwater. The project you see here was in collaboration with our colleagues at Wood Hole, Woods Hole, Norm Farr's group in particular, and we brought their optical modem technology and our underwater chemical sensors together along with some underwater manipulators and samplers and collaborated with NASA to build this one-of-a-kind devices that works on the seafloor. Now, one of my favorite things to share is this little video. I'm going to just mute the sound so I can tell you a bit about it. We're lowering an early version of the abyss to the seafloor to test the optical modem. And what better way to test an optical modem underwater than a selfie? Here's what we did. We put an optical modem on the lander, which you'll see here, and we're going to turn it on in just a moment. I'm going to hit pause. You see there's a blue light right there. That is the optical modem flashing at us. We are this robot sub looking at the lander we deployed. And the robot sub is connected to the ship by a tether. So we get broadband video and everything through a fiber optic tether, very conventional technologies this ROV is. It's nothing you know, too, too earth shattering. We've done this for a long time. But what we asked this lander to do was to turn a camera around back to us, take a picture, and send us a picture of ourselves through this optical modem, no wires. So what you're about to see is the picture of us and it looks decidedly cartoonish. So that's us. Whoops, no, go back. <laughs> Why would you do that on me? Um, my computer has a little mind of its own. It keeps jumping ahead. So let me uh, take a step back and let you watch this. So that's us. So we're flashing back at it. We're turning the lights on and we're now moving the robot submarine towards the lander. And what's really cool is not only do you see us, but you see the jellies and the terrain around us. And it proved that we could actually send video back to us at broadband speeds. And what was really exciting is we tested this over different lengths or distances. Did I have to be up close to it? Did I have, could I do it 10 meters, 50 meters, what have you? And the punchline folks is that we know now how to use this optical modem without this robot submarine. What that means is I can go out with a much smaller boat now and lower the optical sort of transducer is what we call it, lower it on an electrical wire. And I just need to get within 50 meters of this, which is not very hard to do. You don't need super precise positioning. And when I'm within 50 meters, at, there's a, my colleague designed it so these optical modems couple and start talking to each other. And that actually allows us to take a small boat with a little transducer and talk to this thing and use its onboard high def HD video cameras to look around. And we can tell it, move the manipulator a little bit to the left, or you know what, collect another one of these samples. It's the way NASA typically does their lander work, right? When they land a rover on Mars, they send it signals. But here's the kicker. It is in many ways easier to communicate with a, a vehicle on Mars because there's no, there isn't a whole ocean between us and the lander on Mars. And so what we're trying to do here is overcome the challenges of water. So if NASA sends a lander into the European ocean or the oceans of Enceladus, that we have a way to talk with it. So this is a great example of how we can bring together different uh, technologists, different people with different perspectives to solve problems uh, that uh, we both face. Now, in my lab, we also occupy part of an old particle accelerator. And what's, to me, amazing about this facility is that uh, this now retired particle accelerator had a bunch of electronics on the floor here. And it's this giant underground bat cave. Um, it is my favorite place on campus, uh, though many of my administrative colleagues hate it. It's old, it's ugly, they don't like it. But this is exactly the kind of place one needs to build new tools. When we go to see and do research, we often cram a bunch of things into a box, into crates, and we, we uh, load them up, put them on a container, take them out to sea, unpack it on the ship. But some of what I want to do in my research is study animals that live in the deep sea at their natural conditions. And as a PhD student, my professor and advisor was 
was generous enough to help me build these pressure vessels. They are big metal aquaria that I can put animals in and keep them under the in-situ pressures, which is 4,000 pounds per square inch. Now, they're heavy. And as a young graduate student, I had no problems moving the 5,000 pounds of goods onto and off the ship, but I don't like that anymore. So what we've done is just we took inspiration from the International Space Station, and we took an old refrigerated shipping container, this white box that I'm circling here, uh, that was used to ship lettuce to and from Massachusetts and California, and we turned it into this. This is our mobile high pressure van. Uh, you see a picture of it on the upper corner here, um, which I managed to just fade away, but it's, we take this entire container and put it on a ship. And the inside is what you see here. It is filled with these big metal high pressure pumps that can generate 4,000 pounds per square inch. There's a bunch of pressure vessels on the floor. You can see some here under Dr. Jessica Mitchell's feet, for example, that we put animals in and take uh, and pressurize them. This in the lower right-hand corner, these are deep sea hydrothermal vent tube worms, which I'm gonna tell you about in a moment, living inside our high pressure aquaria. And we're looking at them through these thick acrylic windows. So they're living at 4,000 PSI while we're sitting in this nice chilly refrigerated container that's mimicking the pressures in here. And we chill the whole thing to simulate the temperatures of the deep sea. This mobile research lab uh, is, was one of a kind until Dr. Roxanne Beinart, now at the faculty of the University of Rhode Island and a former student in the lab has now built another one. And our goal is to have the two of these operate uh, as freely available as we can make them so that other scholars who may be interested in doing this uh, can pay for the shipping costs, use these, uh, they can use it in whole or in part because we want people to leverage the development efforts that we've already done. Why reinvent the wheel uh, is our motto. And so we're trying to bring a lot of these technologies uh, to the broader community. Now, I'm gonna jump ahead and tell you this first science story. And the science story has some really neat, um, it's a really neat origin story. So I grew up in Los Angeles and I used to go surfing and scuba diving uh, at Malibu Beach, which despite whatever you may have seen on television is not warm, it is cold, and the ocean is formidable. But that's another story. But as a diver, I would walk out and you know swim out about a quarter mile and dive in the 150, 100 foot water, something like that. But that's as far as I can go as a, as a research diver. I'm not gonna dive any deeper than that. And certainly some commercial divers and recreational divers will go a bit deeper, but no one's diving down to these depths. This is 2,400 uh, feet deep, but it's only three miles or about four miles actually offshore of Malibu. And in 2015, I had the privilege of sailing with Bob Ballard and the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is a trust he set up that runs a research vessel. It's actually an exploration vessel that raises monies to go and explore the ocean. And we did a dive here. No one had ever been to this site before. So it's off of Los Angeles. It seems weird that we don't know what the water off, waters off LA look like. And so we dove here and we found this yellow and orange gooey stuff that I'm showing you. But we found this site, which is all of these little goo covered chimneys, which were extraordinary and utterly caught our attention. And that's what my story is about. But we also found these yellow microbes forming what looked like a shag carpet on the seafloor that stretched 1.4 kilometers long and was 300 meters wide. So imagine for a moment you come across a shag carpet that's half a mile long and as wide as three football fields. That is a lot of carpet. And these microbes were lush, which tells me that they're getting food from somewhere. These particular microbes, they use hydrogen sulfide, that nasty rotten egg smelling stuff. And it was an extraordinary find. So we launched sort of two research programs. One, let's study the, sh the shag carpet and figure it out. And two, what on earth are these little chimneys? Now, I'm gonna tell you a bit about hydrothermal vents in the next story. And those are underwater hot springs where we see chimneys all the time, but there's a good geochemical reason that happens. We didn't understand these. 
So we began to poke around at them and we realized that these chimney-like structures are made of chalk held together by microbes. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about these microbes because they're microbes that eat methane. Now, methane is a potent molecule, meaning it has played a major role in the evolution of life and our biosphere. Early microbes on early Earth were likely methanogens, making methane for a living out of carbon dioxide and hydrogen, two simple molecules that are produced by volcanoes and very energetic. So making methane is something very common among certain kinds of microbes. So certain kinds of archaea is what we call them, methanogenic archaea. And it's a potent greenhouse gas too. So as methane rises in Earth's atmosphere, it's really quite potent, many times more potent than carbon dioxide. And it's possible that high methane in the end Permian played a role in some of the extinctions we saw. This is a debated topic, but nevertheless, methane's been around. It's an important molecule for organisms and it's a potent greenhouse gas. Now there's plenty of methane that's made by microbes in the deep ocean. And this so-called biogenic methane represents the overwhelming amount of methane on Earth. The volcanoes make their own methane, but much of Earth's methane is made by microbes. And sometimes they make it so fast and, and in, in such abundance that the methane bubbles out of the seafloor, like you see here. Now here is a riddle. We know that there's gigatons of methane that's produced each year that bubbles out and to our knowledge, very little of it escapes into the atmosphere. There's also gigatons of methane tied up in the deep sea. It's, it's the world's largest reservoir of methane. And so this reservoir of methane uh, is produced mainly by microbes and the parts of it that leak out, let's call it a couple hundred gigatons or so, are consumed by other microbes that are methane eaters. So you got methane producers and methane consumers and they consume methane so quickly that we don't find any of it. Curiously, people have been studying this process for a very long time. And in general, we know about how fast it happens. Uh, and we have data like this. Now, I'm not going to ask you to interpret these data, but just look on the side here and realize that the y-axis is how many sort of moles of methane they eat per cubic centimeter or teaspoon of water or mud. This is how much they eat, and this is how they eat it over time. So we set up high pressure reactors little and other reactors where we put mud or water in there and we watch the consumption of methane. When we went to these chimneys and looked at how much methane they consume, all of those data on the past chart get squished down into here. So all of these data are now down here. They are eating methane at astonishing rates, sometimes up to 12 to 20 times higher than most microbes we measure in the surrounding sediments, literally in the surrounding sediments. What is it about these chimneys that enables these microbes to eat that much methane and so quickly? And so what we set out to do was to really understand and study these chimneys. On the left here, forgive me if it's jittery because of Zoom, but is a, is a 3D reconstruction of the chimney. So I want you to get a sense of what it looks like. Um, it's something you might see in a Studio Ghibli movie if you're into those Miyazaki movies, this weird organic castle. And the different colors are approximately different kinds of microbes. The chimney itself, as I mentioned, is carbonate. And that is in part an end product of eating methane. So we're thinking these microbes are eating so much methane that they're producing gobs of carbonate and kind of mounding atop one another. And this we've seen this before, but only in one or two places on earth, one of them being the Black Sea, where there are these structures that are equally astonishing. But here they are off of Los Angeles, just three miles, it's a couple of miles away from where I used to surf and dive. We then deployed the abyss at the site and used some of its probes to sniff on the water inside here to try and analyze and understand what was happening. You can see my shameless little NASA sticker because I'm, I'm a NASA buff. So I wanted to put a sticker of theirs in our ocean. But um, we've deployed the abyss and, and some other samplers and, and collected fluids from here. 
uh, and then we're able to analyze the chemistry uh, in real time. So I'm gonna move ahead and tell you a little bit uh, about, what, uh, about how this works. Uh, this is just a, a, a wonderful gratuitous picture of the yellow shag carpet we find on the chimneys and it's just beautiful to look at and amazing to imagine that these little microbes um, are doing so much to keep our planet in balance. But back to the methane, how does this work? The punchline, which if you wanna read about is in a paper we recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. The punchline is that these microbes seem to be able to sustain higher amounts of activities because there's more of them structured in a way that allows them to eat a lot of methane. Sediments are not as structured. They get jumbled, worms burrow through them, things get mixed up. But by building these structures, it's kind of like a high density high rise. You can pack a lot more microbes in the same volume. And there actually seems to be fluid flow of methane rich fluid moving through there. So, you know, that's like a buffet. What's also cool about these structures is that they had a lot of this pyrite. Now pyrite is fool's gold, but pyrite, especially natural pyrite is electrically conductive. And now this is gonna really sort of blow you away, but there are microbes on this earth that actually make electricity. They use it as a way to breathe, including some of these microbes that eat methane. So what we think is you've got this high rise structure with lots of methane microbes that, eat, that are eating all of this methane coming at them at a fast pace. They're packed in, they're passing nutrients back and forth because there's different kinds of microbes that do different parts of the process. And they're, they're using this electrically conductive pyrite uh, as a kind of electron marketplace so that the, the one that's eating the methane and has a bunch of electrons can give it up to another microbe that takes those and does something else. It's really astonishing and really exciting. And we're continuing this line of work because for me, it really illustrates this intimate relationship between the, the world we live upon, the rocks and the water and the chemistry and the organisms that live upon it. We as humans sometimes think, oh, well, the ground beneath my feet is just dirt. All it needs to do is be hard enough to keep me walking and standing. Well, that's not entirely true. That dirt supports billions of microbes that purify your water. And in the ocean, there are billions of microbes that make half the oxygen you breathe and so on. So all living things have an intimate relationship with the abiotic world around them, the, the geology and the chemistry of their environment. And this is a kind of natural laboratory to help us illustrate just how important those relationships are. Because without these geochemical attributes, these microbes might not be able to eat methane as fast as they do, right? And that's true for all of these different kinds of microbes. So understanding how the geochemistry of an environment supports these microbes helps us understand how sensitive they are to changes. As we look at a warming ocean, how is that going to affect these microbes? Are they temperature sensitive or is it going to change the chemistry somewhat? So that's the nature of a lot of our research is looking at these relationships. Now I'm going to switch gears for my last few minutes here and tell you a bit about these tube worms that I showed you a picture of before in a pressure vessel. I call this section life in the fast lane because these deep sea tube worms can outgrow just about anything. And the question is how? These are my favorite animals on earth, this little gutless wonder. It, the worm's name is Riftia picitula. It's the giant deep sea tube worm that's been made famous by countless documentaries about hydrothermal vents. Now, I call it a gutless wonder because this worm, which can reach four feet long and you know weigh a you know, couple of hundred grams and has the consistency, by the way, of like a Kilbasa. This is not a, a, a gooey, gelatinous, deep sea animal. I mean, this is a worm. <laughs> and this worm has no mouth, no gut, no stomach, no digestive tract, and no anus. It looks like this sealed off bag. And of course, there's exchange through the, the, the gill, this big red fuzzy thing. But this thing doesn't eat in the way we think of eating. But what it does is grow billions of bacterial symbionts deep inside its body. And those bacteria are extraordinary. 
because they can harness energy from chemical reactions. Specifically, these bacteria use hydrogen sulfide, which they get out of the volcanic water, these hot underwater hot springs they live around. They get the hydrogen sulfide from there and they get oxygen from the deep ocean water. And if you combine those two and react them, you can harness the energy of that reaction, you know, produce power to do work. And they use that to fix carbon dioxide the way plants do. Indeed, when my colleague, colleague Colleen Cavanaugh at Harvard University uh, first discovered these, she was one of the first two people to realize this worm was the first animal ever discovered to have this kind of bacterial symbiont. And it really changed the way we think about how animals interact with microbes, because now you've got this symbiont that can fix carbon using the same biochemical pathways as many plants and feed themselves and feed the worm. So the symbiosis is really special because this worm grows these microbes deep inside its body, like a yogurt culture, and it sucks up hydrogen sulfide from the environment and oxygen and feeds them to its symbionts. Now get this, hydrogen sulfide is more poisonous to all animals, including this worm, than cyanide is. So if you ever if you ever get a major whiff of hydrogen sulfide, and I don't just mean a little stink out of a sewer, but a real hit, like that is dangerous. And yet the worm has evolved this ability to bind it and oxygen and bind it safely and move it to the symbionts. The symbionts process it, they take the carbon dioxide in the ocean water and turn it into sugars and feed themselves in the worm. Extraordinary. And these worms are a foundation species. They build structure for other organisms to settle on. What is equally exciting, at least for me, is that the rate at which these worms fix carbon is extraordinary. Now, here's another data plot. Don't want you to worry too much about it. But for any of you who are sort of specialists out there who, who think about carbon fixation or how much plants fix carbon, usually plants are down here. This is about how much carbon they fix. Riftia can fix typically 10 to 15 times more carbon, almost 20 times more carbon than many, many, many organisms. And they grow faster than bamboo, wheat, and kelp. This is mind blowing. These things, they're plants driven by a, the power of the sun, a star, right? They harness energy from stars and use that light to fix carbon dioxide. And there's plenty of light. And yet these worms outgrow them in the deep dark ocean. How does this work? Well, one clue, and again, don't worry too much about the details if this isn't your cup of tea, but most organisms have one carbon fixation pathway. They have one biochemical way of taking CO2 and making a sugar. Riftia has two. And to our knowledge, the only organisms that have two are Riftia symbionts and, they're free, and a few of their free living cousins. This is not common. And we thought, hey, how is it that even though there's six different ways to fix carbon on earth, almost every animal or microbe, not no animals, no, no, no. Every microbe or plant picks one. No animal can do this but every microbe or plant on earth that can fix carbon has one, except for like Riftia symbionts and a few smattering, which somehow figured out how to harbor two. And, the, and, and again, for you biochemistry geeks out there, it's the Calvin Benson cycle and the reductive tricarboxylic acid cycle. So whatever jargony, but two different ways of doing this. So as a PhD student, to go back one slide, I did this. I studied how much carbon they fixed and established that they can add 10% of their body carbon a day, which is bananas. Imagine going to bed weighing 150 pounds and waking up weighing 165. Like for some of us, that is terrifying. But Riftia does that. And it's a huge advantage in this environment, this exotic live fast, die young environment. But this is about as far as I got. And my student, Dr. Jessica Mitchell, has been a now a postdoc in the laboratory and, and wrapping this research up has been studying how this happens. And what we did is we took our high pressure van to see, which I introduced you to before, maintained the organisms uh, in the system, uh, kept them alive in the high pressure aquaria, uh, which you saw a little picture of earlier. And we gave them different amounts of carbon dioxide and different amounts of sulfide and basically coaxed them into growing as fast as they could. And we saw them, they were growing almost in real time, like you could just watch them come back a day later. And you see this tube, when the tube is old, this is their tube that they build and live in. As it gets older, it becomes opaque, but fresh tube is always translucent. So we would come back and they will have grown four inches of tube 
and overnight. It's bananas. And then what we did is at the end of the experiment, we would take these worms out, dissect them, look at their genes. We use stable isotope tracers as a way of looking at where carbon is going and all this other stuff. And we end up with a bunch of data like this, which I am not even going to talk about. But for you uh, transcriptomic folk out there, we started looking at the genes they were producing. For those of you who don't do this for a living, you can look at what an organism expresses. You know, it's got its genome, and then it makes Xerox copies of different genes, if you will, or photocopies, and uses those to go and make proteins and do work. So we could look at those to understand how this tube worm worked. And what Jesse showed is that both of these pathways are running concurrently when conditions are good. And I decided to spare you the sort of the details, but what we found is that these two different pathways, the genes for them are turned on. And we're studying now the, the metabolites, the metabolic intermediates to see how is this carbon moving around, but it looks like they're running both of them. And we thought, wow, this is really cool. So you run both of them and you fix more carbon. But here's the thing, the carbon fixation rates are like 20 times faster. How do you get 20? times faster out of two. <laughs> so there's still something missing, right? It's not just saying, oh, let's fix carbon with this pathway and turn this one on, and we get twice as much. Somehow, we believe that running two pathways in parallel reduces some of the limitations that other organisms might encounter. And so that's our going hypothesis. We have some leads on this and some approaches, but this is what we're trying to unpack, if you will. But what's cool is to think about Rifty and why this matters to the organism. Survival at these vents, which are short-lived, they live about half a decade or so, five years, and then a vent collapses. Riftia dominates at these vents. They grow fast, they grow hard, they, they release eggs like you wouldn't believe. So it's a very fast-paced lifestyle that is, I believe, enabled by having symbionts that can generate, that can harness a lot of energy produce a lot of sugars to feed them so they can grow fast and do a lot of work. And so something has really selected for this ability and made these organisms successful in this environment. Now I'm gonna leave behind the science stories and just remind us that our ocean is really an inextricable part of our world. Actually, I wouldn't even call it our ocean. It's the ocean, we are a part of it. <laughs> But the ocean is this inextricable part of our world and it's the planet's air conditioning. The ocean absorbs and manages a lot of heat. Uh, in the deep ocean, these underwater hot springs and volcanoes that I mentioned, they release metals into the ocean. And we're learning now that microbes hold on to those metals and protect them all the way up into the surface where they're available to some of the algae that grow and are food for the fishes that we eat. So these deep sea vents, that are out of sight and out of mind and seemingly exotic, there are oceans multivitamin. So the food you eat is in, in, in a real honest way, a derivative of, pro of processes in the deep dark ocean. I'll tell you one other quick story that I didn't wanna sort of try and show through slides, but I mentioned that yellow shag carpet. That yellow shag carpet is very sulfitic. A lot of sulfide comes out of there. And we saw spotted sole, which are commercially fished off California, sole, flatfish, right? Spotted sole would swim down and it looked like they were gasping for breath, suffocating in the sulfide. And being the good physiologist that I try to be, I said, oh, well, you know, sulfide is poisoning them. That's not good. Poor fish got stuck there. But then we kept seeing more and more. And I thought, well, that's weird. This is like a bad day for all these fishes. But then they'd get up and leave. And slowly we began to watch and observe and try and say, well, what is going on? And what we think is happening, and is a kind of a continued area of research for my colleague Lisa Levin at Scripps, is we think that maybe they're going down there and taking gulps of this sulfide to get rid of parasites in their gills. Maybe, we haven't proven it yet. But think about this, a commercially important species for Southern California's $300 million fishing industry goes down and takes hits of sulfide to get rid of parasites. We go to detox spas, they go to tox spas. Take a little hit of sulfide, clean yourselves up, folks. So there's a lots of amazing connections, some of which are uh, a little more cerebral, like the ocean multivitamin, some of which are quite literal, 
like the fish you eat relying on the deep sea as a nursery for their babies or as a place to go get healthy. Now, I still sometimes get the question like, well, what is the deep sea? What has it done for me? Or what has it done for any of us lately? And just as a reminder, half the oxygen you breathe comes from those marine microbes. And I mentioned the deep sea uh, vents being the multivitamin, but even things like whale poop. Whales go down, dive into the deeper ocean. They feed down there, they come up, they poo, that fertilizes the ocean and keeps those oxygen producing microbes happy. The deep sea, as I mentioned, absorbs a lot of heat. It helps moderate temperatures without which our planet would have wild temperature fluctuations. And don't forget, that about a third to a fourth of humankind's protein comes from seafood. And I've heard different numbers, 20%, 25, 33. I don't even think it matters. What matters is that a lot of, human, a lot of humanity depends on the ocean for sustenance. And the deep sea habitats um, are used as nurseries by many of the fishes that we eat. And of course, don't forget that the ocean itself is a $4 trillion industry. If you look at all the economic activity associated with the ocean from tourism, an obvious one, uh, <laughs> of course, I had to put the ever, the ever given on here, but, but the, um, look at the size of this container ship. It's extraordinary how much of a role the ocean plays in human civilization and our economic commerce. And taking care of the ocean isn't just about protecting a deep sea sponge or, or pretty fish. It's actually about investing in this part of our planet that keeps the whole biosphere running and healthy. So I believe that we have uh, an opportunity to look at the ocean the way we look at a savings account. Let's try and live off of the interest in a sustainable, sensible way and not undercut the principle, or else we get to a point where we are doing damage to our planet, including humankind. Now, I shared all this work and I appreciate you, the time you've given to hearing about it, but I wanted to emphasize that I'm very lucky to work with an extraordinary team of scientists who did the majority of the work that you saw. Uh, in particular, Dr. Jessica Mitchell and, and Dr. Jeff Marlowe uh, and Dr. Izzy Baker, uh, as well as my entire lab team. We have an annual tradition of doing a holiday card. Um, last year, we did the Brady Bunch and we because it looks like Zoom boxes. And this year we decided to go with Muppets. So this is my Muppet lab uh, and they are my symbionts uh, and really the ones who did the heavy lifting. So uh, thanks to them and thanks to you for your time. And I would be thrilled to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. That was a wonderful talk, really enjoyable and, and a wonderful message. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few questions coming through, so we'll start with them. And the first one is from Tom Pease, who asks, can these methane consumers be found or adapted to consume atmospheric or methane being emitted from land sources? That's a great question about can we adapt these methane consumers to help us manage methane? Um, the answer is probably. And I say probably because there is, in fact, work being done on that now and has been for, for a number of years. And uh, as always, the issue is, is, well, as is often the case, when you try to have a biological solution to industrial problem is a question of scale. And what's interesting is that a lot of the methane that's emitted by any number of sources, landfills and the like, is also contaminated by sulfide. And that is, challenging for a lot of chemical detoxification processes because sulfide is really harsh on metals and so on. But there are a lot of these microbes that actually can eat methane quite well in the presence of sulfide. And so that was, is what has caught people's attention. So in my lab, we've done some work on that very subject. Uh, and we brought our expertise on these deep sea microbes to bear on the problem and said, well, while we do prior research, we want to support those of you doing applied research. Here's what these deep ocean microbes do here are the conditions they need, and here's how you need to recreate them to make this work. So that is, uh, I think, going quite well. And a lot of people are really trying to move us in that direction. So it's a great question. Thank you. All right, uh, next question comes from Marissa Howard, who asks, um, have you seen a trend in symbionts of being passed down from parent uh, Riftia to offspring? Wonderful question about the symbionts. Some organisms pass their symbionts through 
their moms. Oftentimes, the symbiont will be associated with an egg, for example, right? Other times, symbionts have to acquire, or, uh, organisms have to acquire a symbiont from the environment. That seems to be the case of Riftia. So we know that the symbionts have a free living stage. Uh, we find them, or we find evidence of them, little cells stuck to rocks, uh, genomic DNA signatures, and so on. But we don't really know how it is that a single larval worm as a baby, which by the way, has a mouth and gut, and swims through an ocean of microbes at these vents and somehow identifies this symbiont to the exclusion of all others, and somehow undergoes a morphological change where it seals up and sticks its face to a rock and turns into the worm you see. That part is, is largely unknown and an area of a lot of research. It's a great question. Okay, our next question comes from Eric Waite, and he asks, have you looked for any free living fungi or fungal symbionts at these depths? There are fungi that live down at these depths. Um, a number of papers have been published on them recently. Uh, I have, my lab does not do that work. We are, I personally am excited to see that happen because deep sea fungi have sort of been marginalized for a while. People found evidence of them, but there wasn't a lot of thought given to them. Are they symbionts? Well, not in this particular case, but that is a very good question because we have plenty of examples of fungal symbiosis on land, don't we? And I think there are lots of possibilities uh, for fungal symbiosis in the deep sea. I just don't think we've really studied it well enough to have a good uh, definitive understanding of fungi in the deep ocean. Great, thank you. Um, and from, from Chip Zering, have you done a, a full sequence of the Riftia genome? And if so, can it tell you something about its size, its ancestry placement, its relationship to other animals? Ah, oh, funny, you should, it's almost like I set you up to do this, which I didn't, folks, <laughs> I didn't. But it is a great question. And in fact, just two months ago, we published the Riftia genome. Uh, and it is, <laughs> It was very fun for two reasons. One is Riftia is arguably the, the best studied deep sea animal period in terms of physiology and biochemistry. We've studied lots of other deep sea animals, but because Riftia is so unusual, there's been 35 years of research on, on its hemoglobins, on its proteins, on everything, everything with no genome. We did it backwards. We did all of this biochemical and physiological research and made inferences about the organism. And the genome comes out and validates almost every one of them, which is deeply reassuring because I got in many squabbles about 15 years ago with people who said, no, nah, that's nonsense. You don't have a genome. How could you possibly know? Um, but I have faith in biochemistry and physiology. And I would say as a side note for early career folks on here, um, not every, you know, a genome is a blueprint and a guide to an organism. But there's a lot, of course, that you can learn without a genome. What was exciting is though to finish this genome and say, okay, great, we've connected the dots from genome to transcriptome to protein to metabolic activity. That is what we wanna do. Now, to, the second part that was exciting is that the genome looks absolutely um, unremarkable. We thought we'd find all of these exotic differences and we have not. And that's also cool. Because how is it that, that, that this worm that is so morphologically different from other worms, how does it do that with a genome that looks almost identical to its cousin that looks like a boring worm? That's a cool question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, the next question comes from uh, Matt Harkey, who asks, have you seen evidence of viral infections in deep sea organisms? Yeah. In fact, there's a herpes virus uh, or a, you know, uh, what we believe is a herpes virus, um, which I am not a virologist. so. I just know that that's what it's called in Riftia. Uh, there are plenty of, of viruses. We see retroviruses and the like. So there is a whole world of virology and a good a number of really extraordinary uh, virologists doing work in this area. A colleague Matt Sullivan, Maya Breitart, folks who are really pushing the envelope on understanding the role of viruses in our ocean. Um, but bear in mind, viruses play a really cool role in moving genomic material around among microbes and driving evolution. It's not all bad. Um, in some cases it is, but they are an integral part of the ecosystem. 
Great, thank you. I'm gonna ask uh, one more. Well, the first question that came in, came in from Zach Dench, and it's in the spirit of looking for uh, life, I think, in, other, in, in space. Um, and he asked, when speaking with the NASA engineers, was there any talk of sending DNA sequencers to environments like Europa to transmit possible genetic data back to Earth? Indeed, that has been uh, brought up and discussed, and there are many proponents of that. So the idea is, could you go to a sample and extract the environment and send back DNA? And um, that is, um, th there are people who are very much advocates of that. Um, let me share some of the pros and cons that have been raised. People said, well, first off, no matter where we go, we bring DNA with us. And the process of amplifying DNA, which means making many copies of it and then sequencing it, is kind of how we do sequencing in general these days. Nobody expects to go to Mars or an ocean world and find a microbial mat that we don't have to amplify. Because if we did, we could just see them with a camera. But if you, you know, if they're scarce enough that you need to amplify them, the concern is we're just going to amplify us. And we're going to go all the way to Mars just to see that we're dirty. <laughs> so that's one concern. The second thing is an, equal, uh, an equally sort of valid concern. And that is, what if life on these planets has a sort of a, a slightly different uh, DNA or RNA or an entirely different information molecule. It's possible, in which case it might be folly to go there with a, with a sequencer to try and do that. So that's kind of a hotly debated question right now and, it, um, and we'll see how it plays out. It's wonderful, thank you. We have a few more questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time this evening. So uh, we're gonna wrap up by turning things back over to Chris, but just let me thank you once again for a wonderful talk and a really enjoyable evening. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Thank you. All right, thank you again, Peter. That was amazing. Uh, we're getting a lot of great comments and more questions coming in. So uh, we're gonna have to have you back, I think. Um, thanks so much for so generously sharing your time and your stories with us. Thank you to everyone out there for tuning in, for joining us. I'd like to also give tonight a special shout out to Maggie C. Uh, from GMGI, who crafted the terrific warm up um, and outreach that brought so much attention to tonight's talk. So thank you, Maggie. We hope you'll all come back in February uh, to hear from our next speaker, Dr. Gregory Skamal, who's a shark expert and senior fisheries biologist. So I'm gonna throw up a slide with the date and time um, to, so that you can all save the date and come back and join us in February. Stay tuned and stay in touch. We love hearing from all of you. And we really look forward to the day when we can do this in person at our Institute on the Harbor. Good night, everyone. Good night and thank you. <laughs>